Orlando from Morristown, Tennessee. put together one of the most impressive amateur careers in Southern boxing history. So it'll be Randall and Manley vying for the 1980 Olympic lightweight title. He is currently the number one WBC super lightweight contender. And new champion! I did it! Good God gave me the wheel, I did it! WBC 140 pound champion and the WBA Junior Welterweight Champion of the World, Frankie the Surgeon Randall! I love my job, Ferdy. My dad was born in Birmingham, Alabama, one of five siblings. You know, my dad came from nothing, so uh, he didn't really have a lot. Family didn't have a lot. My great aunt lived in Morristown, and he got sent to live with her when he was in around eight, nine years old. My grandfather's sister uh, took him in as a youngster. Uh, his uncle, he was the one that introduced him to Tally Wood. It was just a little building, but they had fights in there. They could probably seat five or six hundred max, but that was a great place to fight because the people, they would pack it. Frankie Randall grew up down the street from the Tally Ward Recreation Center and would go every day to play ping pong. Occasionally, he would peek into the boxing gym. There was a room there that, that we practiced in. We had punching bags hung up in a smaller ring. He was noticed by Tally Ward boxer Matt Snowden, who convinced him to be part of the boxing team. We picked him up three days a week to go to boxing practice. And he was quick, fast, and I could see he was, he could be, he's going to be a heck of a fighter. The Tally Ward team was headed up by Coach Dick King. Dick King was the king at boxing. He ran it like he's supposed to. He, had, he, he loved everybody. He took care of them. He was a very caring, caring man. He poured his heart and soul into my dad. He believed in my dad, um, and he, he believed in him wholeheartedly. He brought out the best in my dad. Under the tutelage of King, Frankie began his amateur career at the age of nine, but it wasn't the start the new duo was hoping for. According to King, Frankie got whipped in his first four or five fights, and after every loss, Randall cried, quit, and came back. Randall's perseverance paid off, and his fledgling career began to gain traction. After a few years climbing the amateur ranks, the young fighter decided to fully dedicate himself to the sweet science. Now, my dad had a ninth grade education. He went to high school, dropped out in ninth grade. Uh, he put his whole heart became a boxer. Young blood's got no sense of history. You never forget him because uh, he didn't do a whole lot of talking. He let these speak for him. If Coach Dick King used to bring him down to Knoxville to our Golden Glove arena, so that's how I got to know him. Started watching him develop his skills and uh, just determined this, this, this kid is going to be great. He was beating, beating all the kids. You know, his age, his size, he was, he was whipping all of them. He was winning every match. He fought a ton of world-class guys. Army had this, this boy come, the minute he comes in the door, uh, the Golden Gloves Arena down there, he's running that mile. I can't, I can't, I'm going bad news for all 132s. I'm thinking, 132? That's Frankie Randall. Oh, I'm gonna love this. Frankie's just, you know, taking his time. And second round, Frankie hit him with, with two straight right hands, dead on the chin. He fell like a sack of <laughs> potatoes. From losing his first five fights, Frankie went on to win five Southern Golden Gloves titles. In 1980, he found himself in the finals of the Olympic trials. 
His opponent for the gold medal match was Joe Manley from the famed Kronk Gym in Detroit. Although the U.S. had boycotted the 1980 Summer Games in Russia, Randall saw the trials as his own personal Olympics. My name is Joe Manley from the United States Army. The Olympic trials means a lot to me. The most exciting, important thing that probably ever happened to me. I'm looking for victory here. And being in the Olympic trial means a great lot to me, and I hope to come out on top. And it's Joe Manley in the white trunks, and Frankie Randall in the black. Randall from Morristown, Tennessee. Frankie was hanging tough through the first two rounds of the finals, but in the third. Yes, this is one of the better matches of the evening, no question about it. A left-right combination floored Randall. He was able to beat the count and see the final bell. But the victory went to Joe Manley. It is Joe Manley out of Detroit, Michigan. Randall settled for the silver, but went home knowing he had a bright future in the sport. Frankie Randall finished his impressive amateur career in 1982 with the record 220 wins and 16 losses. On February 4, 1983, Randall began his professional campaign at the Knoxville Golden Gloves Arena against Curtis Golston from Kentucky. The 450 people in attendance witnessed the Morristown native deliver a crushing straight right that knocked out Golston in the second round. With his first fight in the professional ranks in the books, Frankie Randall was off to the races in his prize fighting career. How you doing, Mr. Steve? Hey, Frank. You ready to go? Yeah. You ready to work out? Let's get him hard. Frankie Randall decked Marcel Wade twice in the second round Saturday en route to his second pro victory. I lost my mother at a young age, and I had a lot of ups and downs in my family life, and I just took a hold of boxing and wanted to become somebody, and boxing seemed to be the shine of my life, life at a young age, and so it, it meant a lot to me at a young age. When I became a professional promoter, uh, I had a lot of cars out of town, different places, and I could always count on Frankie. I always knew he was going to give me a good show. He was dependable. Undefeated Morristown lightweight Frankie Randall has signed a one-year contract with Alessi Promotions of Tampa, Florida. Randall has knocked out all eight of his professional opponents. For me, it means a lot. And my background, that's all I've done since I was nine years old. So for me, it's, it's my heart. Uh, I got a big ambition to become and be somebody in this game and to do it just as well as for myself as for my mother, who's, who's dead and gone now. Unbeaten Morristown lightweight Frankie Randall picked up win number 11 and his 10th victory by knockout in Tampa, Florida. Obviously, he's got good coordination and quickness, athletic ability. Uh, he's a very intelligent fighter, uh, but the, his big advantage, I guess, is uh, experience. He's had over 300 fights now, and uh, nothing can happen to him in the ring that hadn't already happened before. 16-0 lightweight Frankie Randall scored a devastating TKO over Steve Mitchell in the main event at Tampa's Curtis Hickson Hall. Well, it gives you a lot of self-control, a lot of discipline. It gives you uh, respect for other people, too, as in other individuals. It gives you a chance to walk out with your shoulders up and uh, with a winning attitude. You, get, you know, it just gives you something to carry on your back. It's not a load. It's just something to feel proud of as out of yourself. Frankie the Surgeon Randall was in and out of the operating room early Thursday night, sewing up win number 21 in the second round. Now, the nickname The Surgeon, he doesn't have a medical background, I'm assuming. No, he, he's got a medical background as far as with his hands. He was a tactician, you know. When he was in the ring, it was like an operation. Randall pushed his record to 23-0 Wednesday night with a unanimous 10-round win over Davey Boy Brown in Tampa, Florida. The Morristown lightweight will meet the World Boxing Council's number one contender, Edwin Rosario, on June 16th in London, England. Now he comes across a kid who's had 19 knockouts in 23 fights, who's dying to crawl over him to get into title contention. Very important fight for Rosario. Should he lose here, he knocks himself out of a big payday. Defeating Rosario would put Frankie in line for a championship match, and he wasn't going to let the pressure of fighting a former world champion get to him. Uh, it won't change my style any at all. Uh, it won't change my attitude. Uh, he's uh, used to be a champion, and uh, so 
I'm uh, willing to get in there and uh, perform uh, to my best. Serial scoring on the 10-point must system. The British system awards half points, so a 10-9 round can be a knockdown round. 10-9 and a half, a very close round. Only the referee scores the fight. Frankie came out strong to start out the 10-rounder. Classic counter-puncher. Out speeding him, out jabbing him. But Rosario took over down the stretch. We are just looking for this round to end. After a tough eighth round, Randall was able to make it back to his corner and finish the fight. Rosario is the winner with 98 and a half points. The Randall's 98 points. Half of a point. That was all it took to stop the undefeated run of Frankie Randall. His record now stood at 23-1. and one. His world title aspirations paused. It would be three and a half months before Randall stepped into the ring again. He dispatched Keith Jackson in the fourth round at Tally Ward in October 1985. Two months later, he would do the same to Efren Nevis in the second. Things seemed to be going well for Randall's comeback. His previous two victories ranked him in the top 15 in the world. But an incident in February of 1986 threatened to put Frankie's career on hold. Frankie Randall was arrested for the sale of half an ounce of marijuana to an undercover police officer in Morristown. If convicted, he faced a year in jail. Randall was released on a $5,000 bond and pleaded guilty to two simple possession charges. Presiding over Frankie's case was Judge Eddie Beckner a member of the board of directors of the Morristown Boys Club. During the proceedings, Beckner told Randall, all the little boys that looked up to you, you've let them down. The judge fined Randall $2,000, confiscated his vehicle, ordered him to speak about drug abuse at local high schools, and hold a fight where the proceeds would benefit the Boys Club. In lieu of the proposed 11-month, 29-day sentence, Randall served only two months with the remainder of the time spent on probation and training for that benefit fight. When asked about his leniency on Randall, Beckner responded, I've been on the bench 10 years, and that boy expressed as much remorse for his wrongdoing as anybody I've seen. The circumstances of his life, as well as his obvious remorse for his wrongdoing, were such that I doubt he'll be a repeat offender. Randall's benefit fight was on May 30th, 1986, against the formidable Sammy Fuentes. Matchup, Frankie Randall, former amateur champion. We haven't seen in a couple of years here on Top Rank Boxing. He's coming in here off a pretty long layoff, but he's got lots of hand speed and maybe the style to deal with Fuentes. That bout was a swift affair. Oh, right hand by Randall. It was a straight right by Frankie Randall that sent Fuentes down. I don't think it should go on. It doesn't. I'd like to say hello to everybody in Morristown, Tennessee, for being behind me, standing beside, beside of me and giving me Myself back, and uh, uh, I'd like to say happy birthday to Judge Beckner in Marstown. With the second round knockout of Fuentes, Frankie's career was back on track, and he soon found himself with the opportunity to put some national gold around his waist. This bout is scheduled for 12 rounds, and it is for the vacant USBA lightweight title. The opponent standing across the ring from Randall was an old nemesis. Freddie Pendleton! Randall had defeated Pendleton the year prior after cuts on Pendleton's head caused the fight to be stopped. After the full 12 rounds, the outcome of Frankie Randall's first professional title bout was left in the hands of the judges. The result? A draw by split decision. Okay. Who can argue? Frankie was undeterred by that outcome. I put forth, I think, a great effort in the fight. It was a title fight, something I always wanted. Uh, I'm still here. I still think I should be ready, number one, to contender in the lightweight division. Uh, as all the lightweights out there see my effort, I'm not running, I'm coming. Even though it's a draw, I'm still very pleased. I can still go back in the gym and work just as hard. After his draw with Pendleton, Randall won five in a row and found himself ranked highly in all three major organizations. An opportunity at a world championship remained elusive for the Morristown fighter. And Dick King was willing to sue the World Boxing Council in order for his fighter to get his shot. Frankly, the fights that we would like to make won't fight him because he's very dangerous. 
Another route to a championship match would be gaining the North American Boxing Federation title, whose champion was automatically ranked very highly by the World Boxing Association. The opening bout of the evening, a featured event of the night featuring 12 rounds of boxing for the vacant NABF lightweight championship. So Frankie Randall once again found himself in contention for a national championship. With a professional record of 31 wins, five defeats, with 21 KOs, here is professional Primo Ramos. This bout was also a swift affair. He bangs and down goes Randall suddenly as Ramos with both hands decks Frankie Randall. Ramos sent Randall slumping onto the canvas and he was counted out with 30 seconds left in the second round. All of Frankie Randall's championship hopes crushed under the weight of a single left hook. And just like that, the number one contender in the world. Frankie Randall bounced back from his loss with a nine-fight win streak, but it seemed the spotlight had diminished on his once promising career. His name was now relegated mostly to the TV Guide listing in the newspaper. During the midst of his second comeback, Randall had another run-in with authorities. In August of 1989, Frankie Randall was found guilty on two counts of selling and delivering cocaine, once again to undercover officers. He was given two 10-year sentences to run concurrently at Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary. In total, Frankie Randall spent 14 months behind bars. You know, that's one thing about my mom, that she didn't sugarcoat anything. You know, she, she explained to me what was going on. Most, most parents would try to hide that. Uh, my mother didn't do that. Um, so, you know, I always knew the truth. It was never that, you know, well, daddy's gone away, now daddy's in prison. Frankie Randall's time in prison not only cost him his championship ambitions, but according to him, it also cost him his home and his marriage. As far as, you know, my mom and dad, they got divorced when I was six years old. Uh, so, you know, we spent time in separate households. Randall was released from prison in October of 1990. Shortly before his stint at Brushy Mountain, his contractual interest was sold to Morristown doctor Dan Hale. My brother uh, contacted Dick King about buying his contract. Well, Dick was very uh, uh, easy to convince to sell the contract. And I think it was $26,000 my brother paid for his contract. And the problem was he didn't tell him that Frankie was going to jail. So Frankie uh, was going to jail for about a year and a half, and the contract ran out while he was in, in jail. Dick King did a great job uh, of fundamentally building Frankie Randall the way that he should be. And what I've been told is that uh, he was hard to get along with. Prom promoters didn't care for him. So it made it difficult for Frankie to move when he was younger uh, the way that he should have been moved. They realized after a while that you're going to have to be in a camp that has a, a lot of pull to be able to get these title fights. Whenever uh, you started looking for a promoter, I remember uh, they went up and talked with Joe Frazier about uh, promoting Frankie. And I remember Jerry Cooney promoted a couple fights for him. But uh, once talking to Don King, Don had uh, said that if Frankie could beat a named fighter, that he would give him the fight with Chavez. So it became... Uh, uh, a no-brainer to, to sign with Don. So Don gave him a couple of tune-up fights, and then he gave him the fight with Edwin Rosario. He had uh, beat Frankie early in his career. Frankie always said that was the hardest he was ever hit was from Edwin Rosario. Hector Camacho had pulled out of a fight with Edwin Rosario, and um, Frankie was at the camp training, and they needed somebody to fill in for that fight with Edwin Rosario. And Frankie uh, was biting at the bit looking for an opportunity. He says, I've been waiting to get this rematch with him for a long time because Frankie thought that he won. Frankie Randall versus Edwin Rosario would be part of the very first fight card to take place at the Pyramid in Memphis, Tennessee. Early in the second round, A flurry of punches put Rosario down. It was a short-lived victory for Randall. In the final 10 seconds of the very same round, a right hand sent Frankie down this time. Resilient, Randall rose to beat the count and make it back to his corner. 
The fight continued into the seventh when another flurry from Randall backed Rosario into a neutral corner. One of Rosario's cornermen jumped into the ring, towel in hand, signaling the end of the fight. But the victory was more than redemption for Randall's first professional loss. And that's what got him to be number one across the board in order to fight uh, Julio Cesar Chavez. 51 fights, 48 wins, 11 years. That's what it took for Frankie Randall to finally get his very first world title opportunity. He waited his time. Uh, you know, he, he made some mistakes in life and, you know, he, he, he came the hard way, uh, but he stayed the course. Frankie Randall's opponent was the WBC light welterweight champion of the world and living legend Julio Cesar Chavez, who boasted an unheard of professional record of 89 wins, zero losses and a draw. Boxers were scared of him. I mean, that's just a fact. You know, when you have a record like that, and he was knocking people out left and right. So when Frankie signed to fight him, I was, you know, I, I knew Frankie was a good fighter. Um, but I just didn't think Frankie could pull it off. Frankie Randall came into the fight against Chavez as a 17-1 to underdog. But the aura of Chavez didn't phase Randall's team. Chavez, you know, now what had happened is he had fought Mildred Taylor and Taylor had him beat the whole fight and, and uh, Taylor got caught with the way, the way he, he got tired in the last two or three rounds and got caught at the end of the fight and the fight was stopped with like three seconds left to go. Uh, so we saw that, you know, that fight. Uh, Terrence Ali gave him a good fight and Terrence Ali wasn't a great fighter. When you look at guys uh, as a trainer, you, you can see certain skill sets that a person has. Um, you know, it's just a, a little bit more guidance and to be in tip-top shape in order to pull great things off. We are here at the MGM Grand Garden, the first down, ever baby. boxing event at this stretch, beautiful man. new arena, 15,200 capacity. Fighting out of the red corner, really needing no introduction the world over. Well, I was working the corner, you know, and uh, I guess my first thing when I walked in the ring, I looked over and I said, there's Julio Cesar Chavez, you know, the Michael Jordan of Mexico is standing across the ring from us. Frankie Randall, the challenger, comes out the teal. Nobody really gave Frankie much of a chance to win in that fight. But when you saw the styles, you saw what, how Frankie could fight, and you saw what Chavez liked to do, uh, you, you knew that Frankie was going to give Chavez all he could handle. And if you look at the fight and you see how Chavez would continue to try to press Frankie, and any time Chavez would score, Frankie would come right back and score again. And that's the way it was the entire fight. Oh, that's nice right hand. And that's, that's, it. It. that's right. one. Frankie Randall made it into the championship rounds against the legendary Chavez. Most observers had him ahead on the scorecards. Nothing is ever certain in boxing. And to pull off the victory, Snowell knew that Frankie would have to do something that had never been done before. The belt's right there to be taken, I'm man. I'm a winner, man. We got six minutes, baby. We knew at some point in time to dethrone a great champion, we were going to have to knock him down. Frankie was a tremendous right hand puncher. And, you know, when uh, Chavez had fought Whitaker prior. Uh, to fight Frankie, he had trouble with that southpaw stop. But we were going to train to make that move from left to right. He was sliding uh, from his left to his right to set him up so he can hit him with that right hand uh, straight down the pipe. Oh, there goes Chavez for the first time in his career. Unbelievable. Flush on the face. The knockdown to me was... I mean, it was everything. So for him to, to do that, uh, for me, it felt like that he had really hit, hit the mountaintop. And, and everything that he worked hard for, you could see it start to form. Uh, so to me, that, that knockdown was more than just one punch. That knockdown was his whole life. That knockdown was defeating all the odds. That knockdown represented who we are as a family. Chavez made it to the final bell, and the two warriors awaited the judge's decision. I knew, I knew the knockdown clinched it, but you know, uh, anything could happen to the last second until they really announce it, it's really anticipation. Frankie had laid his head on my shoulder, and I was telling him, 
If God will bless you, you are right. Of the winner and new champion, Frankie, the surgeon of Randall. You know, he put together a perfect game plan. I think, you know, the world saw that. Uh, I think it was something that, you know, shocked a lot of individuals. But it was something that he, you know, he had already visualized. You know, he had already, he, 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 he was ready. You said you had a surprise. Was that it? That was a surprise. I worked hard. I dedicated myself to the sport. I always kept faith in God. God gave me the talent. I worked hard. A lot of people counted me off. I had a lot of problems through my life. But Don King and his family, they stepped beside me, gave me the opportunities. I can't thank anybody anymore. As I'll we, say hello as, to my little boy back in Tennessee markets. I love you, buddy. As, as we, and all the people back in Marstown that believed in me, I made it and I've done it. I proved it. I went through hell getting here, but the hell ain't too hot, baby. I got it. Frankie Randall christened the MGM Grand Garden Arena with one of the biggest upsets in boxing history. He left a contender and returned a champion. It was like all these dreams come true. I've been working hard for so long and uh, it all paid off. Uh, we worked hard at it and we got it. Got the opportunity and then I'm a champion. Now. But I, I knew at that moment in my life had, you know, had, had changed, you know, like I remember being in barbershops in Florida when he lived in Florida and you know we're getting haircuts and he's signing autographs and they're wanting this 12 13 year old kid to sign his autograph and to me that's that's my dad but you know my life my life changed as I knew it uh, he became a household name uh, he became a legend in my eyes I think in the world's eyes as well uh, because he had done something that, that had never been done before. The aftermath of the Chavez victory was tumultuous for Randall. Along with his newfound fame, six days after defeating Chavez, he married his longtime friend Janice and lost his father. If that wasn't enough, the rematch with Chavez loomed on the horizon a mere three months after their first encounter. He fought Chavez the first time on January the 29th of 1994. Uh, he turned around and fought Chavez again on May the 7th of 1994. Uh, you don't see that. That's unheard of. You don't, you don't see many boxers that have that quick turnaround. I think for the simple fact that what he did on January the 29th was so big, uh, you know, I think a lot of people wanted to see if it was a fluke. The fight was set May 7th, 1994 at the MGM Grand Garden Arena. This time, DeMarcus would accompany his father to the match. You know, I would lead him out. I'd go back to the dressing room, get my composure. Uh, then I'd come out in the latter rounds just cause, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's your dad. You know, that's, that's, your, that's your parent in the ring. Uh, you know, no matter how much he loved your job, you know, you don't want to see your parent getting hit. So, uh, you know, you had to build yourself up for that. Uh, but he also, you know, he knew that I was anxious. So, I mean, even before the fights, he, he would always let me know he was okay. Categories. Frankie. The rematch began as the first fight had ended, with Frankie getting the upper hand on Chavez. And a good shot here by Frankie Randall. First of all, Frankie beat Chavez more the second fight than he did the first fight. He was getting ready to knock Chavez out. Hey, hey. Watch the hands in there. Came back to the corner at the end of the sixth round, and he's not going to knock him out this round and went out and was really in, 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 going to destroy Chavez. By the end of the eighth, Randall and Chavez were still standing toe-to-toe -to -toe and trading blows. And right before the bell... Oh, look at this blood! Chavez! It's a bad cut and a real bad play. The headbutt was crucial. If you look, when Julio butted heads, Julio was shaking his head, meaning uh, if a fighter does that, that means they don't want to fight, they quit. Flip Amansky, who was the doctor, had stepped up on the ape in the ring to look at. The rule in the WBC rule book at the time says that the fighter uh, that's not bleeding on the, uh, with, with the butt, they get one point taken away. The fight was stopped on Hamansky's recommendation due to the headbutt. You know, I remember my dad's bodyguard saying, look, we're going to have to get out of here. It's going to start a riot. I remember getting coins thrown at me, beer poured on me, rushed out of the ring. Uh, the decision was made. Of the winner and new champion, Nearby technical decision, accidental headbutt. 
I feel like the, the whole play of this whole ordeal was going based on Chavez, Chavez, Chavez. I was a champion, and to my, in my heart, in my spirit, I know I'm still a champion. People saw the fight. I, I, I feel like I've done a very tremendous job. Right now, I want to take me a vacation, let myself heal up. I went through my father's funeral. I got married. My father died on the same day. I need a break. I haven't had time to even be myself. To me, that was something that was devastating for me. Uh, that was something that was hard uh, to witness just because, you know, at that time, I understand what's going on. You know, granted, it's been four months since they fought the first time, but, uh, you know, my life changed so drastically in four months. So, you know, I was, I was hurt. Uh, you know, but he, he let me know he was okay. It was the last fight by WBC rules to where the guy that got cut, the other guy lost a point, even though it's an accidental headbutt. And if you look at the scorecard, Frankie lost the title by losing that point on an accidental headbutt. So Frankie, yes, he got screwed. We were all extremely upset that night. Anytime you get defeated in a way like that, when you, when you have something that's taken away from you, I mean, you, you didn't lose. You, you wasn't beaten. Uh, when you have something taken away from you, it, it makes you hungrier, uh, but it also builds an anger in you. He was never the same fighter uh, mentally and spiritually. A lot of things disappoint him. He was fighting with anger instead of fighting with uh, knowledge and you know, stuff like that. I, I think he thought that, okay, we fought in January, we fought in May, maybe we'll fought, fight the following year in January or whatever we need to do, but I'm gonna get that third shot. And that third shot didn't come. The, the sad part is Chavez was never ever gonna fight, fight Frankie again in the prime. Uh, King wouldn't let him at that point. They said, okay, we're not gonna get the Chavez fight. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna take these steps. The next step for Randall was fighting for the WBA version of the World Light Welterweight Championship on the undercard of Julio Cesar Chavez's next fight. Frankie's opponent was the reigning champion and southpaw, Juan Martin Koji. Juan Martin Koji, the great champion. He was champion over six years, a six-year reigning champion, WBA. Frankie, he, he had that chip on his uh, shoulder, everything to prove and all that. The chip on Frankie's shoulder proved useful as he would knock the long-reigning Koji down three times in the fight to become a world champion twice in the same year. I prayed and I asked the Lord to give me this fight. I, I had a vision of it last night. Uh, you couldn't ask for much more. It's been a jubilee year for me, like the preacher told me back when I first fought Chavez. Uh, you can't ask for much more. I've been blessed. And I thank God for that. Frankie Randall began 1994 in relative obscurity, but had finally cemented himself as part of boxing's elite. I think I deserve to fight earlier. year. What do you think? I love my job, Ferdy. You know, he was a loving man. He, he, he loved with his whole heart. You know, he wore his emotions on his sleeve. Uh, but also that, you know, he was he was a giving man. He, he, he cared about people. Frankie would give a person a shirt off his back. You know, uh, he, he, you know, when he rose to the top, he helped a lot of different people that were struggling in, in, in Tennessee. Frankie gave a lot of people money and stuff like that to help them out, buy them cars, clothes and food and stuff like that. Uh, because he knows because he was once there. Frankie was the nicest guy that you ever met when he was, when he doesn't, didn't have his demons. Alcoholism, uh, drug habits, uh, you know, you know, you name it. Uh, you know, he, he struggled with addiction. It's probably something that we're not proud of. He's, if he was here, he wouldn't be proud of that. Um, but yeah, he, he did, he did have some demons, uh, like a, any individual. I think what, what changed Frankie was the money that all of a sudden he had. I always said Frankie was uh, a drunk whenever he didn't have money. He became a drug addict when he had money. And that was the sad part. He would get drunk the night before a fight. Uh, the first time I knew anything about it, we were fighting in Monterey, Mexico, and the number one contender was Rocky Rodney Moore out of Philadelphia. Frankie destroys Rodney Moore. Uh, I, the way I remember it, maybe knocked him down four or five times, stopped him in like seven rounds. After the fight, we were fighting at a baseball stadium there. And after the fight, I'm in the back and Fred Jenkins, who was Rodney Moore's trainer, uh, comes over and starts putting his finger in my chest and said, okay, Don, what you got him on? 
I said, what are you talking about, Fred? We don't have you on anything. I said, if we did, it'd show up in his drug test. He said, what drug test? We didn't take one. I said, no, Frank is the champion. He'll take the drug test. But we don't have him, have him on anything. He said, well, I know you do because we saw him every night this week coming in drunk and people would have to carry him in the hotel. Last night at five o'clock, someone carried him in the hotel and he was so drunk he couldn't walk. When Frankie was with my, uh, uh, stayed with my brother, he accepted Christ as his savior. I can remember we brought him, I was living in Grand Rapids, Michigan at the time and Frankie came up and we put him in drug rehab and then he stayed with me. And for six months he was clean. And uh, you know, I was thrilled with what was happening. He was training, he was looking good, feeling good. Uh, Don took him down to Florida to train. He went to a party with Hector Camacho, so the story goes. Hector said, Frankie, let's go ride around, and there he was gone again. I think when you took the road to success that he took, being a kid from Birmingham, five siblings coming up in the 60s, um, you know, not having a lot in, in Alabama during segregation times, getting split up from your family. Uh, your mother gets buried. You don't get to go to the funeral. Uh, you're not a part of that. You know, I think those are some of the things that haunted my dad the most. After two successful title defenses, Randall found himself standing across the ring from a familiar opponent, Juan Martin Koji. There was a rematch clause in that fight, so we had to rematch him, and the fight ended up being down uh, in Miami, Florida. That was crazy because Frankie uh, lost the third round. Oh. Koji knocks down Randall. Frankie it slips, and Koji catches him under his arm, goes down, and the referee calls him a knockdown. So he loses that round plus by two points. So he's down. You know, at this point, by three points, he was winning the fifth round, and there, there's a headbutt. No blood. Koji sticks the glove up to his eye like he's hurt, goes back to his corner. The corner is hollering in Spanish to go down. Koji lays down and will not move, will not get up. He was not hurt. No way he was hurt, but he knew he wasn't going to beat Frankie Randall that night. Uh, and uh, they took him to the hospital, and there was nothing wrong with him. But Frankie lost the title. And this, is a, this is a boxing competition. We're here, it's going to clash. Unfortunately, in my career, it's happened twice. I'm tired of being robbed because of, of I'm the best in the junior welterweight division, and they know that. They don't want to fight me. Chavez don't want to fight me. Oscar De La Hoya don't want to fight me. And this guy here is a chicken. I would rather lose a fight the right way than go out like this. Frankie had once again lost his championship, but this time he was granted a third fight with a man who defeated him under dubious circumstances. We had to go down to Buenos Aires, Juan Martin, Koki's home country. And down there, we even, uh, they doused us in the arena. They threw stuff, bottles, cans, screws, you name it, coins, everything. When we first got in the arena and in the ring, they did the same thing. In that fight, they, their, their heads clashed again. And this time, Frankie fell out. I was saying, Frankie, get up. You can't win like that. He stayed down there for a minute. He started winking his eye and, and got up. But we end up capturing the title uh, again. Frankie the Surgeon Randall became a three-time world champion. But a mere week after regaining his title, was convicted of driving under the influence. And to make matters worse, his urine test for the third Koji fight tested positive for numerous substances, including cocaine, according to the Argentine Boxing Federation. Despite his most recent setbacks, Frankie Randall kept his championship and would be defending his WBA light welterweight title in a homecoming of sorts at the brand new Nashville Arena in January of 1997. The fight in Nashville, uh, I don't think he was ready for it, uh, mentally, physically. Uh, you know, I mean, he he wasn't training as hard. Uh, you know, he was probably not living the best of, of, of lifestyle. My wife and I had taken Frankie and his wife Janice out the night before to Uncle Bud's Catfish Kitchen. At 10 o'clock, we walk him back to his room to make sure that he went to his room. I found, was told later that he left at 11 o'clock and came in stumbling drunk at five o'clock in the morning. Ralu couldn't tie Frankie's shoelaces. In the first five rounds, Frankie dominated. I noticed at the end of the uh, 
fifth round, Frankie got caught with a few shots. At, in the 11th round, Frankie was still ahead on all three scorecards, and they stopped the fight because he was too tired to continue. The winner by way of technical knockout, the new WBA junior welterweight champion of the world, Khalid Railu. Once he lost the title, he lost a lot of desire at that point, and uh, he started fighting for money. Rahilu upsets Frankie Randall, the new WBA junior weatherweight champion. After his loss to Rahilu, Frankie took an 18-month sabbatical from the ring. He returned in July 1998 and racked up two victories before dropping a 10-round decision to Opa Carr. That defeat began a seven-fight losing streak for Randall. At that point, he, you know, nobody really wanted him, and he called me, and you know, he was, of course, he was broke and wanting to fight, and uh, the, I got him some some good fights. You kept thinking I can get him, you know, get him a couple wins because he, he could make some money. And when he would start getting hit in a fight, he could be winning the fight, and he would just quit. That was a rough patch in his life, you know. It was a rough patch in our family's life. I didn't want him to go through that, but uh, it was just. It was all about survival at that point, my man. Now Randall gets against the ropes. He's tired. He didn't have no, no other background. He didn't have nothing to fall back on. When that's all you know. It wasn't about the wins or losses at that point. It was about surviving. It was about using your craft because your craft used you. By 2004, Frankie Randall had lost nine out of his last 12 fights, and his former rival, Julio Cesar Chavez, was in the middle of a retirement tour. Uh, Jose Suleiman called me and uh, told me he, had a, uh, he wanted a, Chavez to have a fight because Chavez was broke too. He said, I want to have a fight where he can make some money. And said, uh, I'll pay Frankie $100,000 to come fight him. So we you know, took the fight. A decade after their first encounters, Frankie Randall finally got his third match with Julio Cesar Chavez. No championships were on the line, only pride. Frankie trained for the fight. Uh, nothing like what he, he did before, but I mean, he was in decent shape compared to what it had been. When we fight Chavez that night, they pick us up in the limo, they have six motor cop, motorcycle cops take us through Mexico City. Now, Mexico City, if you've ever ridden, I mean, stoplights don't mean a whole lot there. They had traffic stopped all the way through Mexico City. We never stopped at a stoplight. We went right through it like we we're the president of the country. And we get to this big bull ring and these people start beating on the car. Frankie's team would look a bit different for the rubber match with Chavez. His son Demarcus would act as a corner man. Second fight. And this is the third fight in their career. Here they go. And we knew fighting Chavez in Mexico wasn't, you know, winning the fight probably wasn't an option at that point. When the fight starts, Frankie is... Uh, uh, he's doing good. It's it just Chavez has headbutted him, he's elbowed him, he's kneed him. And then about the seventh round, he hits him. It not only just hit him low, he left him up off the, the canvas. And I went ballistic at this point. But I know Frankie's wanting to quit at this point. So I tell DeMarcus, I said, DeMarcus, you go talk to your dad. You got to keep him going at this point. And I went over and started screaming at the referee. Don Hell looked at me and he's like, yeah, hey, he's about to, he's about to, he's about to quit. And me personally, <clears throat> I couldn't let him do that. So I got up in the rain. Uh, I worked his corner. I was the one giving him the water. I was pushing him along. Uh, and I told him, it's just me and you. You know, whatever you do, don't, don't quit. Keep going. Finish the fight. And I can tell from that moment that he knew it was just me and him. And he was looking in my eyes, and I know he didn't quit because I got up in that ring. And that's something that I'm gonna carry with me and, until, you know, hey, until I'm gone. El Gran Campeón Mexicano Julio Cesar So Chavez gets the unanimous decision victory. And I wouldn't really, really wasn't worried about whether he won or he lost uh, that night. I just wanted to finish. Finish it. You know, finish it for me. It's just me and you in there. And we're going to get through it. And that's what we did. Frankie Randall continued fighting until the following year. 
His final match would be at Gund Arena in Cleveland, Ohio, against junior welterweight contender Craig Weber. Yeah, then, you know, fighting Randall, then you, you know he's older, but he's still dangerous. I remember watching him fight Chavez when he beat him. Uh, you know, I'm going to have to be at the top of my game. And when I bought by him, I think he was 42. He was past his best. But, you know, Frankie Randall was Frankie Randall. He was a bad dude back in the day. Craig Weber defeated Frankie Randall via a sixth-round TKO. After 22 years as a professional fighter, Frankie the Surgeon Randall retired with a record 58 wins, 18 losses, and one draw. Retirement, you know, he went, he went through some hard patches. You know, he went through some rough times. Uh, you know, he, he, he was in and out of jail a little bit uh, through, through bad choices, bad decisions, uh, dealing with addiction. Uh, and then, you know, things started to happen. He wasn't the same individual anymore. You know, his, his mind started slipping. You know, he really wouldn't, you could tell something wasn't right. It was something that I kind of, I kind of tried to run from just because I didn't really know what to do. And, you know, you, 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 you know, your dad's going through something, but you don't know how to help him. We. We did what we had to do as a family. Uh, we checked him into a, uh, a facility in Chattanooga at first, uh, getting him some mental health, and you know that's where he was diagnosed with the box of dementia. Things are down, goes Randall suddenly, and Ramos with both hands decks. Frankie Randall Faber coming in here. I'm not sure he's going to get out. He is not. This one is going to be all over, I believe. He's nowhere close to being on his feet. He got leveled with lightning. Wow. So watching that clip, it looks like he has a lot of the symptoms of an acute concussion. He looks dizzy. He's unable to maintain his balance. Um, he looks confused, disoriented. He's having what's called an ataxia. He can't grasp his balance. Again, that old term, punch drunk. He has almost a drunken gait. And so uh, it's hard to watch, actually, because you know that he's experiencing tremendous discomfort. In CTE, or dementia pugilistica was the older term. The early symptoms are changes in behavior and personality. So it's subtle things in the beginning. It's not severe memory loss and severe Parkinson's symptoms right in the beginning. And at the last stages, you have very severe cognitive deficits. So your body falls apart. Your body could be injured from the sport, but now you're very stiff. You can have Parkinson's like shuffle tremors, loss of balance, and then also have loss of bodily functions. You watch the decline. You know, you watch as things started going downhill as far as for him physically and mentally, uh, and you, you, you try to, as a family, it was something that we really wanted to keep private. I saw what my dad was going through from, from going from this man that used to operate in the ring and move around and could glide, and now he's in a wheelchair, he can't walk. Uh, suffering mentally, you know, body kind of drawing up. Uh, yeah, man, it was painful. When he was in the, uh, the senior home where he had dementia, that he used to keep his, uh, his bag packed his, his, with his boxing equipment and all that, and he said, my trainer's, Aaron's coming to get me to train. So even though he had the dementia, that's how much he loved it. When I went there, he didn't know who I was. Uh, I started showing him pictures, and all of a sudden, you know, it bring back. You know, it would bring back, and I would show him pictures of the Chavez fight, and he wanted the pictures of uh, that, but he didn't remember you know, much of, even about that fight at that time. Um, and that was probably five years before he passed away, because uh, later he went back over to East Tennessee. Uh, but yeah, it was so sad that uh, he didn't know who I was. What was that like for you to be in the room with all that going on? Sad. Yeah, I cried. I watched my dad die twice. You know, I watched my dad die when they diagnosed him with, with that. Uh, 
and then I watched him pass away physically. Uh, and that was something that, that took a toll on me. It was hard. I had to walk in a room and, you know, your hero, not know who you are. Uh, he didn't. He didn't know who I was. Uh, didn't know my name. And it's something that we went through for almost ten years. When Frankie passed, everything was taken care of. Uh, they did a beautiful job with his services, Baron Frankie. And his son Marcus really, really took care of him. Uh, yeah, in the end, uh, like a real uh, son who uh, Frankie loved. There's no better perseverance story than Frankie Randall. He in, had to endure a lot of, a lot of ups and downs, and, and he made it. World champion, how many people can say they're world champion? Not very many. Frankie loved boxing, uh, and you could tell that whenever he would, he was really into it and working out, you could tell that he loved it. Uh, you know, he came up with the phrase, I love my job. And uh, the whole time he was uh, working out, you would hear him keep saying, I love my job, I love my job. I mean, that's something I have tattooed on my arm. Uh, it's his favorite quote. I mean, he, um, he gave his blood, sweat, and tears to the sport of boxing. Uh, so that's something that I truly believe that he lived by. Um, I mean, I don't think he would have been as great as he was if he, if he didn't love his job. When Frankie was in the gym, he always liked working with the younger kids, showing them what to do, showing them where they were doing something wrong. I always said if Frankie could have just beat the demons, he could have probably been one of the all-time great trainers uh, because the kids loved him, he loved the kids, and he knew what he was doing more so than any trainer that I was ever around. He's a true example of what boxing's all about. You know, to enter in the kid neighborhood programs and start boxing and then come out of those programs to go on to become uh, champion of the world. He was more than just a guy to beat Julio Cesar Chavez. Uh, that was that was one thing he did. That was a small thing that he did. Uh, you know, my name is Frankie Randall, by the way. Frankie Demarcus Randall. You know, that's something that took me a long time to 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 grasp, uh, to fully understand. That was something I ran from. I'm, I'm him. You know, that's my dad. Uh, you know, to the world, he's, he's he was a great boxer. Uh, he was he was he was good at his craft, but at the end of the day, that was my dad. You know, that was my hero. Uh, but yeah, he was everything.